There's been a hole in Z Meyer's life ever since her husband of 31 years, Warren Meyer, went missing. On Easter Sunday in 2008, Warren, a seasoned hiker, planned to take a simple walk from the Dom Dom Saddle picnic grounds, 80 kilometres northeast of Melbourne. The night before, he and Z visited a local supermarket to pick up provisions. Sitting in their car, Z noticed that Warren's shopping bags included an oversupply of batteries for his GPS, a sign of his you can never be too prepared philosophy. The next morning, after a few mumbled words and a sleepy kiss, Warren was gone. There's a hole in my heart the size of an island There's a hole in my heart the size of an island Islands can be big and small Ever since Warren went missing, Z's entire world has changed. Her home used to be filled with the sound of his favourite country rock music or the corny TV shows he watched, but now it's silent. There's an empty space by her side that was once occupied by the tall, fit, smiling man who was her companion on countless walks and hikes. In the years after his disappearance, walking alone felt strange uncomfortable, wrong. Ironically, it was just such a hike that took Warren Meyer from his family more than 12 years ago. Warren loved hiking and had traversed countless miles across the globe, including the great trails of Machu Picchu and Kokoda. Friday, March 21, 2008, marked the beginning of the Easter long weekend. Warren and Z had planned to take a trip with eight friends to the scenic town of Healesville in Victoria's Yarra Ranges. The group checked into the Badger Creek Caravan Park that evening. On Saturday, March 22, they visited a restaurant in town for dinner, where Warren was in good spirits. He told everyone that he planned to take an easy, straightforward hike from Dom Dom Saddle Picnic area in the morning. After dinner, Warren and Z stopped at a local supermarket to pick up supplies for Warren's hike, where Warren, who was known to always be prepared, made sure to purchase more batteries than he would need for his GPS. When Warren came back to the car, he was carrying two bags, two white plastic bags of um, goods, and I happened to look in there and saw that he had an oversupply of batteries, which is so typical of Warren, overdoing everything. We always had a standing joke when he was being uh, particular, which was that an old cousin of mine used to wear braces and a belt at the same time, the theory being that if one gave out, he always had the other. This was a well-used joke over many years between Warren and myself, and he knew where I was going when I brought that up, and he just laughed. It was their last shared laugh. The week before had been exciting for the Myers, one in which they had signed off on a major house renovation and finalised plans for a much-anticipated trip to Canada, Warren's country of origin. Plans for the future were signed, sealed, delivered and ready to roll. On Sunday, March 23, Warren woke up early in anticipation of his walk. He told Z he expected it would take a few hours to complete, but he would meet her and the rest of their group at one o'clock for lunch at Hillsville's RACV club. Warren showered and ate a quick breakfast before leaving the caravan park around 7.30am, dressed in light shorts, a t-shirt and walking shoes. Ever prepared, he made sure to take a backpack that contained a map, a handheld GPS, a mobile phone and some snacks. To this day, One of Z's greatest regrets is that she didn't drop him off at the trail's starting point and pick him up at the end. A plan proposed the previous day, but later changed due to Warren's early start. He simply didn't want to inconvenience her. I don't think any of us have a crystal ball or realise when talking with a loved one that may be the last time you will ever see that person. 
I reflect back on that morning when Warren was getting organised and leaving the cabin and we just talked mundanely about him coming back to meet up with friends for lunch. I wished him a wonderful hike and uh, then he was gone. By mid-Sunday afternoon, Warren's absence at the pre-organised lunch with friends sparked Z's immediate fear something was wrong. Her husband was experienced and always reliable. This was so unlike him. Z headed to Dom Dom Saddle accompanied by half the lunch party and found Warren's white Subaru parked and locked in the car park. A later inspection of his vehicle confirmed it appeared untouched and that Warren had taken his backpack with him. Initial relief flipped quickly to fear when Warren couldn't be found. What followed was, in Z's words, a hell of a week. A week of constant searching, of sleeping in the backs of cars for two nights because she couldn't bear to leave, of tireless official searches, in excess of 150 people in the air, on foot, on horseback and motorbikes, police search and rescue, bush search and rescue, local police, the SES, the CFA and tracker dogs. There was even electronic tracking via the mobile phone believed to be in Warren's possession. The media descended from all sides for a story, a clue, an outcome. And at the end of those five long, hard, draining days, Z was left still hoping and fearing, still without her husband and without answers. The search was cancelled on Friday, March 28. Dr Ian Miller, an expert from Melbourne's Alfred Hospital, had assessed the circumstances surrounding Warren's disappearance and concluded that it was almost impossible Warren could still be alive. Dr Miller's belief was that Warren may have become incapacitated in the first 24 hours and subsequently been unable to respond to searches. Without medical attention or shelter, Warren's chances of survival were deemed small to negligible. With the search officially called off, Z returned home. This was beyond hard. Her world had shifted on its axis. Wandering from room to room, she passed through the space that no longer contained Warren. Standing in his purpose-built office, the pain hit harder but it was entering their bedroom and seeing his clothes hanging in the wardrobe that was the biggest hit of all. It was a shock coming to terms with the fact that he might never return home to wear them. In that first year after Warren's disappearance, Z, her family and friends conducted their own searches almost every week. The day Warren hiked, it was mid-twenties, sunny, everyone was saying it was an Indian summer. And the two nights I slept out there, it was really, really warm. And I remember keeping windows down and the mosquitoes coming in and bothering me because it was very mild weather. On the third day, the heavens opened up and we had heavy rain. And that's when my heart really sunk. There was an urgency to the search then, of course. I thought, there's no way Warren could survive this. That's what my feelings were, but the family and myself, we believed on that second day that Warren was, well, we had started to think that he was no longer with us as early as that because he was so careful and cautious with his hiking. He had everything there and it was only a simple morning's hike. And he had asked me to go with him, to drop him at one into the hike and pick him up at the other and he changed his mind because I would have had to get up early. That is a really big regret on my part that I never went with him. But if others are involved in his demise, I feel that I too would perhaps not be here and I'm the anchor for my family. Meanwhile, investigators conducted their own inquiries. At 57, Warren had still been enjoying a successful career as a consultant civil engineer. Police looked into the possibility that he had been under financial strain 
or were setting money aside to start a new life independently, but found absolutely nothing. With no evidence to suggest Warren had deliberately gone missing, police turned their attention elsewhere. Upon learning that an involuntary psychiatric escapee had been seen in the vicinity of Dom Dom Saddle between March 20 and 24, investigators became concerned that Warren might have met with foul play. They searched the individual's home and tested some of his shoes and clothing for blood, but his clothing had already been washed by then, and nothing of interest was found. On the day Warren vanished, he had taken Z's fully charged mobile phone with him. Some information suggests that the phone last pinged at a nearby tower at 9.01 that morning. But Warren's phone network, Optus, haven't been able to confirm this. There's a possibility the ping actually occurred the day before when he made the last call on this phone. A second formal search in April 2008 was followed up with a third in October. That same month, Warren's family went public offering a $100,000 reward for information leading directly to the recovery of his remains. A credible tip was given that, quote, out-of-control shooting had taken place along the Monda track, a well-known walking track near Dom Dom Saddle, at the exact time Warren was hiking. It emerged that a witness first reported this to police just one week after Warren's disappearance, but the Meyer family only learned about it more than six months later when they went public. On October 29, 2008, after the family had pushed for police action, investigators took a statement from the witness who said he'd heard the shots being fired from the direction of the Monda track at about 3 p.m. on Saturday, March 22. The shots sounded as though they were coming from high-caliber weapons and continued for two hours straight. The witness heard the shooting again the next morning from around 8.30 exactly when Warren would have been hiking in the area. Moreover, Warren's car was parked directly across the road from where the shooting took place. The theory that Warren might have been accidentally shot by a stray bullet received lots of attention in the media, but police have stated they were unable to establish a connection between the shooting and Warren's disappearance. They believe that if Warren had been inadvertently shot, evidence of this would have been discovered during searches of the area. To this day, Z believes this issue has not been adequately addressed. The years moved by slowly without any further information coming to light. But in 2014, during a missing persons campaign organised by Victoria Police, a claim was made that Warren had been killed and disposed of after stumbling upon a cannabis operation and that he would, quote, never be found. This prompted Z to start a campaign she called Speak Up for Warren in 2015, which in turn led to a further allegation that two warring gang factions were behind the out-of-control shooting. Police investigators followed up this lead through surveillance, but ultimately concluded the information wasn't credible. Police have theorised that Warren may have suffered a medical crisis that prevented him from being located, or perhaps that he'd been injured after wandering into difficult terrain. The case was referred to coroner John Ollie in 2011, who passed down his findings six years later in December 2017, stating, Although I have no direct evidence, the circumstantial evidence satisfies me that on the balance of probabilities, Warren likely died of unknown causes on or after 23 March 2008 when hiking. Clearly, his body, or remains, have never been found. I find that there is no evidence to suggest the involvement of any other person in his suspected death. I am satisfied that no further investigation is required. In 2018, a retired senior police detective undertook a forensic investigation into Warren's disappearance and uncovered some concerning new evidence. He submitted his discoveries to police and Coroner Ollie, the latter of whom then investigated the matter further. Details of his investigation were provided to the family in late 2019, but the matter is still ongoing. As so much time has passed since Warren's disappearance, Z believes that getting to the truth is much harder. For her, the shooting remains a significant issue. 
she's convinced there are people who know what has happened to her husband and that it's time for them to speak up. Dealing with Warren's disappearance has not become easier over time. It's been 12 years now since Warren went missing and it does seem surreal. It seems like it happened yesterday. Warren's parents have passed away and they never got any answers and that is a pain that I carry each day. I witness other families, parents, brothers and sisters pass away and don't have answers and this really haunts me. My little grandson, when he was three, he was already looking for his grandpa. And in a cafe, he saw this man and he said, that looks like grandpa. He's only three years old. It was, I was shocked. I don't think he understands what missing means, but he knows that grandpa isn't in his life for some strange reason. And the three other grandchildren, they will have to face this mystery. The second eldest, she once said to her mum, Mummy, your daddy's not here anymore, is he? So she's already thinking. Z will join me in the studio after this word from our sponsors. Is there something getting in the way of your happiness or stopping you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp is not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It's professional counselling done securely, online and from the comfort of your own home. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. They offer a broad range of expertise that may not be available to you locally and you can start communicating with your counsellor in less than 48 hours. I recently signed up to BetterHelp and I honestly can't praise it enough. Mental health is a cause very close to my heart, and the whole process was easy and most importantly felt really comfortable. BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide. Log into your account anytime to send a message to your counsellor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. And you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room like with traditional therapy. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit betterhelp.com slash missing. That's better, H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. As a special offer, What's Missing listeners can get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash missing. And now Z joins me in the studio for a conversation about her husband's disappearance. You and I have known each other for quite a few years now, sadly. But you're, well, in the context, (laughs) you're brilliant. And I do so greatly admire your commitment to this. I think the lengths you've gone to for your husband have gone so beyond any standard demonstration of unconditional love. And the fact that you've been able to maintain that energy because it is utterly exhausting is just phenomenal and I I know that people outside of the bubble in which we live don't have an understanding as to what that experience is like and I think it's therefore really important that we are given a chance to elaborate because if you do get media opportunities, they're, you know, you've got 20 seconds here or you've got one or two paragraphs in a in an article This is an opportunity here in this podcast to really elaborate. So we're really glad that you've come in to to share your side of the story with us. 12 years is a very long time to live with the not knowing. How do you cope? How are you still being able to, to maintain this dedication? One of the ways I cope with life is to live one day at a time. And it has been 12 years. I've had to endure much in that time just on a practical level of trying to go from one day to the next. One of the things that has been very upsetting is that it took 10 years to get a death certificate. 
that put me in an almost impossible position. And if I didn't have experts such as lawyers and accountants helping me through some of the tangle that was there, I probably would have given up. I am very, very thrilled that I have really good quality people in my life. When I got the finding that said Warren was deceased, I thought the next step is to get a death certificate. So how do I do that? There was no advice coming to me from the coroner's court. They're the ones that have made this declaration and I assume there must be some sort of documentation that I need. But to have nothing offered to the family was incredible. I went to births, deaths and marriages and how I was treated by them stood out in stark contrast to this distant way of dealing with myself. The lady said, you need special documentation from the coroner's court and we will facilitate that. We will help you out. We understand what you were going through. And that's what she did. Such a kind act and it was finalised very quickly. I remember one day I took it into a bank. I needed to change the account details and there was a lovely lady there in the bank and I said, you know, this flimsy document has taken 10 years to get, and it now means I can join the human race again. That I don't need to explain myself anymore, I can say my husband's deceased. Well, the lady burst into tears and so did I. It was one of those moments where you realise the battle has been going on for so long. We knew Warren was deceased in the first couple of days. But no one acknowledged that in an official sense for 10 years. And I don't think that's fair. It's not. And in those 10 years, you would have had endless administrative and practical obstacles because you didn't have that piece of paper. What's an example of of the administrative nightmare that people like you have to endure? Warren owned a business and he had a partner, thank goodness, so the business side could continue. Getting letters, closing out things like CityLink, all those things that you take for granted from day to day. And when I moved house, I couldn't even, with this particular bank, change details because I needed him to sign this form. And I tried to explain to this woman and she refused to accept the change of address details. And I said, well, what's the point of sending letters out to my old address? Because there'll be no one there to pick it up. So I got a professional to help me with that. And that's how I limped along from year to year, basically. And 10 years is a very long time to deal with the fact that you know your husband's missing, but it's not being acknowledged anywhere. And that assistance that you had, that was all privately coordinated. That was not given to you. You had to seek that out Mm. and pay for that. There is a massive financial cost, I would assume, in having that sort of assistance. Yes. The people that helped me were professionals and I had known them for, our business had been going for quite some time and so I knew them through the business and I felt lucky that I had these good quality people. But even when Warren's finances were checked six years down the track, when I went, finally went to the coroner's court, the police went into my accountant and went through all the paperwork because everything else had been archived. So many years had gone by. And of course, I was charged a cost for the time the accountancy firm allowed the police to be there to go through the documentation. So those are the things that no one knows about and it's the first time I've ever spoken about that. And you can understand the accountant is providing service for us and gave up time to allow this person to go through everything. But it wasn't our choosing that all this would drag on for so many years that everything was being archived and hard to get hold of. What about the other types of 
impacts on you and your family. There's a financial impact. There's obviously an emotional impact. But did you notice any physical changes? I mean, stress does trigger a number of ailments. I had a couple of really significant health issues that required operations in those first years. And I believe the urgency of these operations were triggered by the stress that my body was carrying. And of course, they still carry that stress. My children have had counselling and it could be that they need counselling through their lives from time to time when they have difficult patches in their lives because how do you deal with this issue? They have children now and these children, these grandchildren will never see their grandpa and he loved children. The journey he would have done with them would have been wonderful and it's just not there. It really does change a family dynamic significantly. And in your case, it was that you suddenly became a single parent. I mean, your children were adults by then, but still, you became a single parent. And how did that change your family unit? Were there any shifts? It was really interesting because Renee was 26 and Julian was 24, and Renee would still go hiking on the weekends with the dad. She'd phone him up and he would be so excited because, you know, she was of of an age where, you know, a lot of um, young women wouldn't be interested. He was so flattered. And they did the Machu Picchu trek three or four months before Warren went missing. It was a very special time for them. And Julian did Kokoda with Warren about a year before that. So I feel at least they had that special time, but there were huge gaps. And one of the most um, cruel moments in a way was when they, my children got married and their dad wasn't there. We missed him terribly on those days. I walked Renee down the aisle and I know that um, the two of us should have been doing it and there wasn't a dry eye in the place. Same with my son getting married without his dad there so difficult. Did you notice your young adult children become a bit more parental with you? I know that for me, when my parents were stressed and devastated by the disappearance of my brother, I found that subconsciously I became a bit more parenty and a lot less childy, you know, like I didn't want to give them any more stress. So if, you know, something trivial happened that maybe in the past I would have um, gone to mum and dad with, I didn't bother, you know, I was so conscious of their grief and their pain that I tried to be a bit more nurturing and take care of them through this awful experience. And I wonder in particular with your son, did he seem to take on any of the sort of father figure, man of the house type responsibilities when Warren wasn't around? My son's fairly quiet and he doesn't reveal much and I was very worried about the fact that he was so quiet and he actually started to see a psychologist but he didn't tell me because he didn't want me to worry and I dragged that out of him and I said to him, I think that is the best news. You don't hold those things back from your mum. Those are the things I want to hear and I'm so pleased you were doing this. I said, you need um, schools to navigate life now. It's not like it used to be and there's a big hole in our lives. So to see you taking such a proactive stance, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear. Both children have stayed very close to me and I think in many ways I'm the anchor And I think they realised that maybe mum wouldn't be here if she'd gone with dad that day. And that's a scary thought. So, and I adore the children, you know. I'm doing the job of two grandparents. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. I want to ask you about a few, I've got a few key themes that I think most families will have experiences with. One of them, I know that there's a lot to cover uh, around 
police and the coroner. Um, you touched on media. Have you had good, bad, ugly experiences with media? The media is an interesting one because when they get to know your case more and more and they get to know you, you actually find some understanding and care that wasn't there in those early days when you weren't known. I've met so many wonderful journalists and as the years go on, they've shown an interest to always keep in touch and and know what's happening. It's a very exhausting road for someone like myself who doesn't like publicity and often I just want to close the door on the world. But the principles behind what I'm saying need to be out there and so I need the media's interest. When I feel cases, say when a person goes missing and there's all the urgency of a search, it is so scary to have the media there with their cameras, with their microphones, and it's something I had never experienced before in my life. And in those first couple of days, I simply could not talk to the media. But when we came back from being on a track or whatever, they were ever there and it was quite intimidating. And sometimes I see people react in a raw manner, attacking a camera or whatever, when the media have turned up and there's been a tragedy of some sort. I don't condone that action, but I can understand the panic that's there because the normal person hasn't experienced anything like it. But I must say I've met some wonderful journalists and I can't speak highly enough about them. I'm glad to hear that. It is a very odd situation where you're going through an absolute tragedy and it's all happening around you and then suddenly there are these strangers with cameras in your face at your most vulnerable and they want to broadcast that to the entire nation. It is a very unusual experience to find yourself in. I can still remember that first day, Easter Monday, because people were returning to Melbourne and they were coming through in great numbers and there was there was the police helicopter hovering above and they just drove into the car park in droves and I just stood and stared at all of this. These people are having a wonderful time. I, I felt at our expense. But, you know, there was all this drama unfolding and I can't explain to you how numb I felt. And then in that environment, I'm trying to cope and answer questions from the police and keep my fingers crossed that Warren will be found, try to show an interest in the search that's taking place, trying to give as much detail as I can. And then in the mix of all that, family and friends turn up and then the media descend you know, in great numbers and where it happened is sits on the doorstep of Melbourne. It's not a remote area at all. And did you find that people would notice you from the media and stare and be curious and ask you, oh, aren't you the wife of the hiker who's missing? Did you have that type of Well, it was interesting because I wasn't eating much. I was in so much shock and there was a police food van and I just walked past it. I was in a daze and he said something kind to me, like he knew who I was and it gave me a bit of a shock because a day ago no one knew who I was and here this man is acknowledging me as the um, hiker's wife. It's a bit of a shock to the system to go from being not noticed to being significantly noticed. And in my suburb where I lived, of course, I was noticed big time. Some people knew what to do. They would come up and chat and others would walk across the street because they didn't want to be caught in an awkward um, position. And I can understand it in a way. I, I learned very quickly if someone was feeling awkward, I would go up and give them a hug. Uh, leading the way. I mean, how do you um, say to someone whose husband's missing and all in the news, how do you approach that person? 
I did it once to a, a friend that I hadn't seen for quite some time and she was so relieved. She said, I'm so glad you've come up to me because I've wanted to speak to you for a very long time. So I know the ones that crossed the street, they weren't bad people. It's just that they didn't know what to do. Of course, they didn't know what to say. It is a very unusual scenario. And it's awkward enough to talk about a standard loss, let alone a, an uncertain loss. People are not comfortable with uncertainty. Yeah, I think many people have had that scenario socially. And has it impacted the way that you identify? Do you feel that people feel sorry for you still? And do friends ask, you know, do you have a feeling around no longer having a husband, therefore you're not a wife and you don't have that relationship anymore, but you do. It's a very strange circumstance, but how do you feel your identity has been changed by this? Well, Warren and I, we lived in Beaumaris for 26 years in the one house. I taught at the local high school and Warren was very active in the children's sports, you know, and also played basketball locally with his son too. And so we also played tennis and we did competition tennis. We were really well known in the area. So to have someone like Warren go missing, it was just, it rattled everyone. I've had people say I was walking through the airport and the news came on and it said that Warren was missing and it just stopped me in my tracks. The pressure has come off a little bit, but I still see the occasional person staring and whispering about me. I've got used to it. It's been 12 years. But the pressure in Beaumaris being in the limelight was too great and I sold my house and moved away. I've spoken to other families that have been in a similar position and they too have said they've had to sell up and move away. I haven't moved far away. Uh, Warren and I loved living by the bay but I had to give myself a little bit of space. Understandably. Do you think that there are others in your position, men and women, but maybe particularly women, who have a husband, say, that disappears and a certain amount of time passes and if they were to start a new relationship with someone else that the public's perception of them would be negative? Do you expect, I know that's not applicable perhaps to you, but to others in your situation, it's something undoubtedly that they would have to endure is the judgment. Absolutely. I'm sure there would be judgment. I believe Warren's my one and only and I'm committed to him to, to the end, but I have heard of a case where a wife moved on and there was quite a bit of judgment in relation to it. It's awful. There are just so many different layers to the grief and the challenge and the devastation in this very unique type of trauma. I want to ask about the whole police handling slash mishandling and the coronial process for you. The fact that it took so long is unacceptable. Well, I believe that um, policies have to change. I believe that our case was so complex and rare that no one registered it. The investigator talks about experiential bias, which means that when something comes along that's out of the ordinary, it's not recognised as that. How else can you explain the neglect of the key issues that happened in that first week where I went missing, that action wasn't taken? To me, how can you not take action on the out-of-control shooting? Warren's car is parked across the road from that event. The people reporting it to a local police station are genuine people. My brother and I spent a day with them in October and we walked the distance and we talked and walked. The one detective we were given, the regional detective, he was meant to come and spend that day with the family and he didn't show up. Now, what does that tell you? And this is seven months down the track about how the police were handling our case or 
I believe, not handling our case. What was the excuse that they gave for him not rocking up that day? The excuse he gave was he's back from holidays and he's too busy to come. Such a slap in the face. And there are so many of them. Mm. Gosh. One of the concessions just recently is there was a an absconder from a psychiatric a hospital who was wandering the area for days and he had homicidal ideations and it was believed that maybe there was some connection between Warren and this man. Six days down the track, this investigation was shut down and it, he was just called another visitor to the park and um, we wondered why that was. Now, the detective we had passed on to homicide that there was only a one-hour opportunity that Warren and this man could have crossed paths. And given that the journey was from Dom Dom settled down to campers, who gave him a lift, it was eight kilometres. So therefore, given the terrain, the two of them in that limited window of opportunity simply couldn't have come across paths. We wondered about this for years until we found out they're operating on a false premise. So you shut down an investigation after six days based on a false premise. It was never one hour, it was two. It was well documented, Warren going on this hike around eight o'clock, this man walking into a campsite around ten. Now, my maths tells me that's two hours, not one. We tried to tell the coroner, we tried to tell the police repeatedly over many years and it's wrongly documented in the finding. After that finding came down, I wrote a formal letter of complaint and I said, you have inaccuracies in your finding. It's always been two hours. The investigator we have, he walked the distance and he said there was at least 20 minutes that Warren and this man could have crossed paths. The police have now walked the distance And they also agree that if it was two hours, the two men could have crossed paths. How do you get back an investigation being shut down six days down the track after Warren went missing? You never get that time back again. How they found out about him being picked up by the campers, this is the police, was that they put an appeal out. That was the only public appeal they put out for us. And even that was stuffed up. So disappointing. And the fact that on just the fifth day, Dr Miller decided, based on his reasoning, that it was... When we do know that people have come out of snowed in areas after 12 days and they've been found alive. How did that feel so soon into this that the authorities running the show very poorly, had already not given up but closed that first crucial element, which is the the search and rescue. The official search stopped after five days and I just watched a whole line of vehicles drive out of the car park, down the road, and I thought, where do we go now? Where do we go? We're in this incredible limbo. And I was still half thinking, well, Warren could be pinned under something. You know, it's only five days. But that's what we were granted. There was a search based, a weekend search in April. And then when the police found that we were going public in October, they offered up another weekend search. I have nothing but praise for the searches. The police search and rescue were excellent. I query, you know, five days, is that enough? The local people, the SES, CFA and local police were extraordinary and the level of compassion that we felt was extraordinary. But when it came to the investigation, well, that was another matter altogether. Just the fact that it took so long to get before the coroner and for for you to get a finding, 10 years... It is atrocious. And that throughout that process you weren't supported by... Communication or lack of was one of the worst things the family had to deal with. It was so frustrating. 
communication with the police, you know, whoever is on holidays is not there when he comes back, the investigator not responding to emails, not returning phone calls. And these were just reasonable contact that a family had or should have had with an investigator. And then when he disappeared for good, when he wasn't coming back, no one told us that. And we accidentally discovered it because we approached the coroner's court thinking that he's actioned the paperwork to start the process. He had told my solicitor in May 2008, even though it was too premature to be doing it, but he told my solicitor he was actioning the paperwork. We left it for two and a half years and were absolutely shocked that our case hadn't even reached the coroner's court. And from that, it just dragged on and on. And in 2013, there were two hearings In the first one, the police were instructed to do a review. The coroner wanted to know what had been done, what hadn't been done, and then everyone would come back and then go through this review. Um, I think that was in three months' time and there actually was an inquest set down for that September. When this second hearing started, we all turned up I paid for my legal team, my barrister to be there, and we discovered the review hadn't even been started. And the coroner said, something just happened, something broke down. No apology to the family, no understanding of what it took for us to get there with the hopes that we could go through this. And then, of course, the inquest was shelved, never to surface again. So disappointing. It's scandalous. And this was, you had written to, was it the police chief commissioner in regards to the the conduct of the police investigation? After the finding came down and we could see there were inaccuracies and bias, I wrote a formal letter of complaint to the coroner's court and I was told that the coroner's court work in conjunction with the police and that the letter had been forwarded to the police. That was in February 2018. I've only a couple of weeks ago or a week ago received... The result of that review, which is a flimsy one-page letter acknowledging that if it was a two-hour window of opportunity, the two men could have crossed paths. But, again, they reiterate they believe Warren's gone into terrain that is difficult. I think the first time that I met you in person, it's weird because... You become a member of this community and you know people, you feel you do, and you, you know, see them on social media and in traditional media. But the first time I met you in person was at a vigil, a ceremony, would you say, in, oh, in Dum yeah, Dum Saddle? That's what I was wondering because I've known your mother yeah. before that, of course. Yeah, and I think that was 2015, perhaps. Seven um, years, yeah, you're right, mm. 2015. And so what prompted you to, because I can only imagine how much energy rather goes into putting together an event like that. Why did you want to to hold that ceremony vigil for Warren there? We held a vigil which was seven years after Warren went missing because time was just slipping away and nothing was being done and there had been concerning issues the year before and I thought well we'll just have to try and attract a bit of public attention, but also family and friends were, it was strange, it was seven years, but family and friends were frustrated. We'd had a vigil there on the first anniversary. And then I thought, well, we just can't let any more years slip away. We will do this again. I do not like the place up there. It takes great courage to go back and there will be some more media attention with the investigator and I need to go back. But I go back with great trepidation and we exhausted ourselves in that search. 
not just the search, we also investigated, we door knocked locally, we spent a lot of time at the local pub, which was a great way of tapping into some of the issues that was around at that time. We left that place disappointed and totally exhausted after those two years. And I really believe others have taken Warren's life and they've got away with it. And there were activities up there on that Easter that were so shocking that have never been addressed. And so it just, I almost feel sick to the stomach if I go back. I can only imagine. Do you get a sense from people that because so much time has passed and because you are quite sure that Warren died that day or very shortly after, that because of that and, you know, he's likely not still alive, that you should just be therefore able to move on and that there's a, an idea that if you do have a an event like a memorial, a ceremony of sorts, that that helps you move on and that you can just sort of lay it to rest? Do you do you find that anyone in your social circles or even outside of that, maybe comments on social media or what have you, allude to that sort of notion that that's possible? Well, the interesting thing is the family and friend group haven't moved on. I can't see how you can move on from something like this. As I said, if there's a death, and my father was killed in a car accident when I was a child, so I know what tragedy is and I know that you can in some ways accept what has happened, even though it's very tragic, but there's an answer. But I've read comments on social media that can't believe that people in my situation, not necessarily myself, but you know, time has slipped by. You know, too many years have gone by. I think it was Lindy Chamberlain, a comment that she wanted something resolved after 30 years. She wanted acknowledged what had happened to her baby, which actually happened. And people were saying, well, who cares? It's been 30 years, which is a terrible statement. And if that person making that comment was in a similar situation, I doubt whether that person would be moving on either. And as in terms of human nature, we need to have answers. You know, that's why some of the family groups I know that are dealing with things after 50 years and I still see the tragedy on their faces. And do you think that there's, I don't know if you've experienced it, but a sense of guilt if you are to close a chapter or move on or make a concerted effort to step back from this exhausting search campaign, you know, mission, do you feel that guilt or can imagine that it could be there? I can't imagine giving up on Warren or stepping back. I think over time you have to accept that the odds are stacked against you that you're going to find answers but that doesn't stop you from still putting it out there because sometimes those answers might come 30 years down the track and they've been just over the last year, I think there's been a couple of cases. So the fact that this is so unique though and this isn't, say, a husband who's done this to a wife 30 years ago, it's a true mystery on so many levels, which makes it harder to get answers, I believe. But no, I will never give up. I think a, a situation that many people struggle with, I know that we did, is getting rid of, selling, you know, whatever it is that assets, their things, their clothes. Their... Dan had a lot of gym equipment that was taking up a huge amount of space in mum and dad's house. And it was a real challenge to get to a point where we felt comfortable parting with his possessions. Have you had to endure that scenario with any of Warren's? It's interesting, the thing about possessions... I don't put much store on that. I know some people will leave a bedroom the same as it was when that, their child went missing. Because I felt I had to move, I then had to streamline my life and so I had to let go of Warren's possessions. 
the one thing that I value, we got the most beautiful pottery piece from our wedding. We got married in Canada and this was a gift from Warren's company and it's pride of place. So I'd rather not have a whole lot of small things but have something that is very special to both of us and keep it there in a central position. It's not obvious to anyone who might walk in the room, but I know the significance of that gift that sits there. It does, absolutely. I cherish the few things I have of Dan's, but of course, over the years, for lots of different reasons, you do have to part with with some things. What kind of changes, you've touched on this in regards to police and coronial matters, but what changes do you want to see in the space of missingness and support for people like yourself and your family and your friends? One of the um, things I want changed is I don't think you can leave it open to just one regional detective to take on a missing person's case. I think it needs to be recognised that every case can be raise a red flag or be a unique case until it's proved otherwise. But if you come out with an opinion, you offer it up to a family, oh, you know, they've the case that I can think that's 50 years old, they've run away and that notion stayed for 30 years. The very fact you utter something, such as in our case, silly bugger has got himself lost, it's raising a notion that is hard to let go when other events surface and these events aren't looked at. The regional detectives that take this up, they're slotting it in with their day-to-day other activities. You can't slot in a case like ours into these other duties that you have from day to day. I think the whole approach to missingness needs to change and families need to be listened to. They should be shown that respect instead of police should never be offering up an opinion. They should be throwing the net wide until it can be proved otherwise. And I've spoken to so many families whose experiences are the same as ours. I couldn't agree more with all of that, see? Because one thing that blew my mind when Dan went missing was that there was no missing persons unit in Victoria. So Victoria Police didn't even have a missing persons unit until 2012. So when Warren went missing, that was the case. And they also didn't have any guidelines. Can you believe that? Warren's computer was taken away four and a half years later, if you can believe this. Even though they were pursuing a rumour that he'd gone to Italy, we endured that rumour for five years because it finally went to the coroner. And in frustration, I said, you haven't even taken away his computer four and a half years down the track and we're dealing with this other madness. Don't you think computers carry a story of a person? It was only then that the computer was taken away. So there was this complete ad hoc approach and actions only taken when the family had had enough. I just cannot understand how there were no procedures There was no unit. People have been going missing since the dawn of time. How was it that only in 2012 they decided to to create? And even then, my understanding is that then and even possibly now that it's changed hands a few times, it's solely within homicide. And it's only a certain type of case that might actually make its way there. So it is incredibly frustrating. I think it needs to change. I really think there needs to be a central body. And... I don't think one detective somewhere in the country has the ability to handle cases. You know, we know that most people turn up, but there are cases that are so unique and so different that just slip through the cracks all the time. And it's largely because families aren't listened to. Their ideas are completely disregarded despite the fact that they know their loved one better than anyone 
and they and could help. And not only that, the missing person isn't profiled. That's part of the problem as well. I mean, you can understand it does happen, at least in Australia, it's every 14 minutes that someone goes missing and it's an overwhelming task to be dumped on police. But it's such a broad topic that it needs to be reframed in a way that allows for all different types of people who go missing for all different sorts of reasons to have the same standard of support for them and their their loved ones that are involved. It's not good enough that it all just gets chucked in often a too hard basket and then it, it does slip through the cracks. I think there needs to be a formula. I think it wouldn't take much if you actually profiled a person and listened to the family to raise a red flag. There are clues to every missing person and it should be the police's duty to work on those clues, not ignore them as they did in our case. What is your relationship with hope? You can never give up on hope. I probably clung on to it much more in the past than what I do now, but I know cases can turn around in an instant. Often it only takes that one phone call. Am I losing hope? I probably am a little bit because I can see myself passing away without an answer and that's a terrible thing to accept. But I'm a bit of a realist and I know 12 years has passed. Uh, Unless someone comes forward or unless Warren's remains are found, we won't have answers and I'm almost prepared for that to happen to us. What do you think it's going to take? I mean, you you offered a $100,000 reward and then you upped that to $200,000 up until the 10-year mark. What are your thoughts on the fact that nothing... Well, uh, police will say that sometimes people fall out. You know, I'm not referring to our case in particular, but sometimes people do their liaisons with other people, are no longer there, and it might be that there's a divorce, a wife keeping the secret with the husband. There are times when people, the conscience gets at them, eats away at them. But I think there are some people who are just evil. And I never really understood how evil people can be until what has happened to us. Just even in the way people treat families of the missing you know, the trolls and hoaxes and things like that. So you've experienced hoaxes and trolls? Well, I better not talk about the hoaxes because that's an active investigation, but I'm thinking I've just finished reading William Tyrrell case and that's what has happened with that family. There's a lot of victim blaming, blaming of families when things can't easily be understood. And some families go through absolute hell because of it. It's awful. On top of everything else, to have to deal with that. Yeah, it's it's disgusting. I think the lengths that you have gone to and continue to sadly have to go to are really just extraordinary. And that everyone that knows you must be so proud Warren would certainly be extremely proud of you and we're very grateful that you were able to come in today and and share your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Today, Z wishes she could have a final conversation with Warren. She would love to tell him that his beautiful children, his two motivations in life, have married and that they missed him desperately on their wedding days. She wants him to know about their grandchildren, Cooper, Amelia, Lola, and Oliver, and how beautiful they are. Sadly, in time, they too will have to grapple with this family tragedy. And she would love to share one last joke with him, just to hear his laugh once more. Her sliver of wisdom for others traversing the painful path of a missing loved one. When life is at its most difficult, courage is the only thing we have left.
Warren Meyer's episode was adapted from original writing by Paul Bougea. Missing Persons Advocacy Network is an unfunded charity run by me, Lauren O'Keefe. In 2016, we started a project that paired authors and artists with Australian families to tell their stories, to humanise missing loved ones beyond the stats they're typically reduced to. Though it grew to comprise murals, songs, sculptures, documentaries and coffee cups, our modern take on the old milk carton campaigns of the 80s, it began with a book called Two Short Stories. The What's Missing podcast was inspired by that book. These stories are but some of thousands. Help us help the usually unseen, unheard, forgotten community of those left behind by heading to our website where you can donate or get involved. mpan.com.au That's mpan.com.au You can find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter using the same handle. Mpan Oz. That's M P A N A U S. If you have a missing loved one, check out our guide at missingpersonsguide.com.